It was on a moonless night in the early summer months of 1993 that Jennifer Ertman and her best friend, Elizabeth Pena, would depart from the Spring Hill apartment complex off of West 34th Street in Houston, Texas at around 11 p.m. in the evening. The girls were returning from a pool party and they wanted to make it home before Elizabeth's 11.30 p.m. curfew. Since they were running a bit behind schedule, they decided to take a shortcut through the Clearbrook apartment complex, which would lead them out to a railroad bridge and then out to a trail known as the White Oak Bayou through T.C. Chester Park. This shortcut had the potential of saving the girls about 10 minutes over their normal route. However, on this particular night, while walking along the bayou, these girls would be viciously attacked by a local youth gang who would rape, assault, and kill the girls, leaving their bodies in a forest area near the south entrance of the park. This is truly one of the most violent and horrific tragedies that I've run across, and this video series is aimed at providing a level of clarity to the Elizabeth Pena and Jennifer Ertman case. Please strap yourself in as we get ready to dive into part one of three. It's June 24th, 1993, and the day starts out like it normally would for the soon-to-be high school sophomores. The girls were in the midst of enjoying their summer vacation and are even planning to hang out later in the afternoon at Elizabeth's house. As luck would have it, they're going to get the chance to attend a pool party that's being held by their friend Gina Escamilla over at the Spring Hill apartment complex. At 4.15 in the afternoon, Jennifer's father, Randy Ertman, would drive his daughter over to Elizabeth Pena's house. Elizabeth lived about four and a half miles away from Jennifer on a street called Lamont Lane. It was there that he would say goodbye to Jennifer and the girls would spend the next few hours at Elizabeth's house as they eagerly looked forward to their plans for the evening. 14-year-old Jennifer was the only child of Randy and Sandra Erdman. She was described by those who knew her as being caring, intelligent, and had a good sense of humor. Jennifer had a love for jewelry, often wearing multiple necklaces, earrings, and rings. Fashionable but modest, Jennifer was also known for being a caring friend. 16-year-old Elizabeth Pena was the oldest of three children. Born to Adolf and Melissa Pena, Elizabeth had gone through a brief streak of teenage rebellion before entering Waltrip High School in the fall of 1992. Jennifer and Elizabeth would meet in their freshman year and quickly became close friends. Despite being just over a year younger than Elizabeth, her family would notice the positive influence that Jennifer was having on their daughter. They were genuinely thrilled that their daughter had found such a great friend. At approximately 8 o'clock in the evening, Elizabeth's mother would drive the girls to the Silver Creek Apartments on Mangum Road. Before dropping them off, Elizabeth would promise her mother that they would be back in time to make her curfew. Feeling satisfied with their agreement, Elizabeth's mother would drive off, leaving the girls to hang out with their friend, Gina Escamilla, for the next few hours. Meanwhile, in a neighboring suburb of Oak Forest, a small group of street thugs were getting ready to hold a gang initiation ceremony for 17-year-old Raul Villarreal. Villarreal had expressed interest in joining this group, who jokingly called themselves the Black and White Gang. They were a mix of teens, mostly between the ages of 17 and 19, and had a gang leader named Peter Cantu. Cantu had a long history of violent and disorderly conduct, and due to his frequent arrests, which involved stealing, car theft, assault, and even murder, he was well known to the local authorities. His ideal way of testing out the newcomer Raul Villarreal was to have him fight everyone in his gang. Peter would recruit the help of his friends, as well as one particularly vicious criminal named Sean Derrick O'Brien. 
The gang would get liquored up and would drive over to O'Brien's residence at the Clearbrook apartment complex. After recruiting O'Brien, the gang would head through a broken part of the fence that would lead them out across the railroad tracks and into the park to begin their brawl. Meanwhile, on the other side of West 34th Street, Elizabeth, Jennifer, and Gina would decide to go over to Gina's friend, Chris's house. Chris lived in an apartment complex that was just down the street from Gina. It would take the girls only minutes to arrive at the Spring Hill apartment complex. Once there, they would hang out by the pool. It was now approaching 11 o'clock and Elizabeth's curfew was coming up fast. This made Jennifer Ertman nervous. She didn't want her friend to get into trouble for missing her curfew, so she mentioned to Elizabeth that they should probably get going. The girls would head off on foot back towards Elizabeth's house. Their friend Gina Escamilla would accompany them at this time. All right guys, so that does it for part one of this video series. Check back in for part two, where we'll be discussing the different pathways that the girls had available to them and also the inherent danger of walking through this park late at night. If you enjoyed watching this video, then please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you at the next one. Before we start today's video, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a mention to Corey Mitchell. I'm sure that many of you watching this video are familiar with who he is, but in case you're not, he was the one that wrote the book Pure Murder, a book which documents this awful tragedy and provides us with many answers as well. Without the work that Corey Mitchell had put in, we really wouldn't know what we now know today about this case. My goal with this video series is to address some of the questions that I've had ever since I first learned about the murders. Although the criminals were brought to justice many years ago, there are still some unanswered questions about why this crime came to be. I won't be going into the details of what happened to the girls during the assault, nor the trial of the criminals. That information has already been covered before. However, I would like to share with you what I have learned about this case. I know that many of us still have questions about it. So without further ado, welcome to part two of three. The time is now 11.15 on the evening of June 24th, 1993 and the girls have reached the Clearbrook apartment complex on West 34th Street. They have about a mile to go to reach Elizabeth Pena's home. And at this point, they have a couple of different options available to them for reaching their destination. The first is to continue down West 34th Street until they reach the intersection of Jester Boulevard, which they'll take north until they come up to Lamont Lane. The second is to take the back way through to the park. We already know the direction that the girls would ultimately take. So let's just say for the sake of argument that they had continued along West 34th Street and had taken it up to Jester Boulevard. I've done a fair bit of research into the crime levels of this area and from what I've been able to piece together, I can say that this particular stretch of West 34th Street probably wouldn't have been considered extremely dangerous back in the early 1990s. However, this part of Texas was experiencing issues with gangs 
and criminal activities were on the rise back then. I think it's very fair to say that this area would not have been a great place to be walking around at late at night, especially for two young girls. To further illustrate my point, I'm going to bring up a graph from CrimeGrade.com. This graph provides a street view of the areas that experience the highest amounts of crime. The green areas are the safest and the red areas are the most dangerous. We can see right away that this park carries with it a much higher level of crime than the neighborhoods on the other side of the road. Now as we approach the corner of Jester Boulevard, we can see that there's not a lot in the way of streetlights. I would imagine that this area north of the taco stand would be quite dark late at night. In fact, it almost looks like a country road. We're going to head up a little bit further and we've now reached a bridge. If you look off in the distance, the fenced area that you see is actually the back of the Clearbrook apartment complex, now known as the Montebello Apartments. The girls would have started their journey from back here by slipping through a gap in the fence. According to what I've read in Pure Murder, the fence actually had barbed wire at the top, yet another important reference to the amount of crime that was in the area back then. Now as we proceed up ahead, we'll notice that the sidewalk on the left side of the road is going to turn into a bike path. This trail is called the White Oak Bayou, and it eventually leads out into the park, but not before we hit the railroad tracks. And these tracks are actually quite important because they're one of the only ways out of this particular portion of the park. As we continue further ahead, we're now going to see that the sidewalk takes us into the park. There's also a sidewalk on the other side of the road, which of course you can take north. But let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that the girls had decided to head into the park. It's a nice summer evening, we'll just take a stroll through the park over here, and do you see that flattened land just past the trees where there's like an open area immediately before the forest? Well, this is the area where the gang members were fighting each other at. So I'd just like to point something out. Even if the girls had left the party early and they'd taken their normal route, they could have still run into the gang here. Now things could have been different for them, of course, but the threat of danger is still very much there. There's also the chance that they might have run into something else had they proceeded further along into the park. It does have some blind spots and areas where a potential predator could have also been hiding. However, this unfortunately pales in comparison to what I'm going to show you next. We're now going to explore the alternative shortcut that the girls had decided to take through the park. In order to access this shortcut, the girls would have had to walk all the way through to the back of the Clearbrook apartment complex. Once they reached the fence, they would have had to pull back a loose board, which would have allowed them access to the grassy area behind the apartments. There are no park lights in this stretch between the back of the apartments and the railroad tracks, nor would there have been any lights along the pathway ahead. This means that the girls would have had to navigate this path completely in the dark. Remember again, it's a moonless night and they don't have any flashlights with them. Now as we take a look at the surrounding terrain, we can immediately see that this area is much rougher looking than the pathway along Jester Boulevard. The grass here is very long and there's a lot of gang graffiti as well. Another concerning element to walking along this path is the amount of overgrowth from the nearby trees. This would have made it very difficult to be sure of your surroundings as you're walking along the path. The potential for a predator to be lurking in the nearby forest or perhaps even under the bridge is another thing that you would have to consider. How easy would it be to get away quickly if you needed to? In my opinion, not very. This path is filled with blind spots where you can't be sure of your surroundings until you ascend into them. Even the bayou in the middle of the park provides another obstacle. The final stretch of this path involves walking up a blind hill. Off to the right, there's an area of open space that can't be easily observed until you've ascended the hill. And then beyond that is the white oak bayou, 
which you can take out of the park. I won't sugarcoat this when I say that it made me absolutely sick to my stomach when I first saw this bridge and pictured the girls walking across here late at night. Why would Elizabeth and Jennifer feel comfortable going this way? It's been a question that's always bothered me ever since I first learned about this case. And then I did some more research and I came across something very interesting. According to what's been reported, it was Jennifer Ertman that wanted to go this way and not Elizabeth Pena. Elizabeth actually lived fairly close to the park. However, Jennifer lived about five or six miles away from here. So you have to ask yourself, how is it possible that she would have the knowledge of the shortcut? She didn't live with an easy walking distance of this park, yet she felt comfortable enough to suggest that they go this way back to Elizabeth's house. She even knew about the loose fence at the Clearbrook apartment complex. This indicates to me that Jennifer and Elizabeth must have taken this exact pathway many times. Why else would they have felt so comfortable with taking it late at night? It also stands to reason that both of the girls would have been very knowledgeable of the terrain along the pathway and that the lack of visibility would not have presented a significant problem to either one of them. We also have to take into consideration that Jennifer Ertman had a curfew and she hadn't told her parents that she was planning to spend the night at Elizabeth's house. Another thing that must be considered is the time in which the girls entered the park. The court records showed that the girls were attacked by the gang at roughly 11.30, at which point they were roughly a mile away from Elizabeth's house. Even if the gang hadn't been there, they still could not have made this curfew. Now this is a very interesting situation in which the girls know that they can't make the curfew and yet they still choose to go into the park. Clearly their reason for going this way was not because of the curfew. So then why would they choose to go through the park? Why didn't their parents offer to give them a ride home? Why didn't the girls call their parents to get a ride back? Why were the parents comfortable with letting them walk back? In the next part, we'll be discussing the aftermath of what happened the following day, the timeline for when the police were brought in, and the reason why I believe there's a lot more to this case than was originally reported. I look forward to sharing that information with you in part three. I will see you at the next one. Born on June 21, 1977, Elizabeth Christine Pena was the oldest child of Adolfo, Adolf, and Melissa Pena. Growing up in the bustling city of Houston, Texas, Elizabeth could be described as a happy-go-lucky child, winning over most people with her friendly demeanor and easygoing personality. She was well-liked by her fellow classmates at Waltrip High School and often enjoyed the simple pleasures of teenage adolescence like talking to her friends over the phone or going skating at Tradewinds Roller Rink, formerly located off of West 34th Street. Elizabeth also loved going to the beach and always looked forward to her family's Florida getaway trips where she got to take part in one of her favorite pastimes. Elizabeth had two younger siblings, a brother named Michael and a sister named Rachel. Today, we celebrate the life of Elizabeth Christine Pena. Hello and welcome to our bonus content from the documentary series, Innocence Lost. I'd like to start this off by saying that I'm truly grateful to be able to provide you with this content and hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have about the Jennifer Ertman 
and Elizabeth Pena case. As you no doubt know, Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena were two teenage girls that grew up in Houston, Texas, back during the early 1990s. They were tragically murdered on the evening of June 24th, 1993, while attempting to walk through a public park. Sadly, the lives of the girls could have been saved had they gotten a ride back home from their parents. In this video series, we'll be taking a look at the backstories of both girls, the options that they had available to them, and the reason why I believe this crime was allowed to take place. This video will cover the girls' pathway through T.C. Chester Park, the location where I believe they were attacked, and also some very important information that could explain their decision for going through the park. Please strap yourself in as we get ready to dive into the bonus content of Innocence Lost. On the evening of June 24th, 1993, Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena would attempt to walk through a public park in Houston, Texas. Their reason for doing so was to make Elizabeth's 11.30 p.m. curfew. This is the official explanation that was given as to why they went through the park. However, I'm here today to tell you that I believe the official narrative is completely false. While it's true that the shortcut that they took through the back of the Clearbrook apartment complex probably is faster than taking their normal path back up Chester Boulevard, the truth is that you can actually take this shortcut without going through the park or even up to the railroad tracks. The shortcut that the girls took involved walking to the back of an apartment complex, pulling back a loose part of the fence, and then sliding through. Once they were on the other side, they actually had three ways of getting back to Jester Boulevard, a street which they would ultimately have to cross in order to get back home. Their first option is by far the simplest, and that is to walk directly east, roughly 600 yards, to Jester Boulevard. The second option is to walk up to the railroad tracks, cross the bridge, and then follow it out to Jester Boulevard. The girl's third option is to walk up to the railroad tracks, cross the bridge, then immediately descend down a hill and follow it north until they reach a blind hill which they must ascend. They'll then need to walk through a stretch of flattened land before they can finally exit the park. Now that we understand the three paths that the girls had available to them, I'd like to point out that the distance between the three exit points is exactly the same. In fact, it could be argued that paths 2 and 3 are significantly slower than path 1 due to the difficult terrain and the fact that the girls would have had to travel west, a direction that would take them away from their destination. If time was truly the reason for going this way, then why choose the slowest and most difficult path? In this part of the video, I'm going to show you the trail that the girls took up to the railroad tracks and where they encountered the gang. The girls would have started their journey into the park by walking up to the parking lot that you see on the left side of the screen. They would have walked through the stretch of open land to where the fence is. If you look closely at this picture, you can see a city light on the north side of the field. This is quite possibly the only source of light that the girls would have had available to them as they made their way up to the fence. 
This tree line runs parallel with the fence, and as I mentioned in my previous video, it would have made it impossible for the girls to have seen what was around the corner. After slipping through the fence, the girls would have headed north along the trail. If we switch over to a ground view, we can see that the overgrowth from the trees blocks the view of the path leading up to the railroad tracks. The girls would have had to walk around this tree before heading north up towards the tracks. It was at this point that they encountered the Sandoval brothers, two of the gang members that did not bother the girls. I believe unfortunately that it was very shortly after this point that they encountered the rest of the gang. What I simply do not understand about the situation is why wouldn't the girls have turned around once they heard the gang members up ahead. They probably would not have been able to see them until they were up close to the railroad tracks. However, these guys were all drunk and would most likely have been swearing at each other loudly. I don't believe that the girls stumbled across them blindly and the evidence supports that they did not have a significant fear of them either or they would have not felt comfortable trying to walk past them. This leads me to wonder as to the mental state of both girls. Is it possible that they were under the influence of drugs or alcohol which they might have gotten while at the pool party? When we take into consideration that Jennifer's father, Randy Ertman, had admitted to having a problem with alcohol, this leads me to believe that Jennifer might have had access to alcohol at an early age. When put into context, this could explain their decision for trying to walk past the gang members. However, it does not explain their reason for being in the park. Most retellings of this story say that the girls took the shortcut for the sole purpose of making Elizabeth's curfew. But as we've already established in part two, the girls were already too late to make this curfew and they were in the park of their own free accord. Since we know that the girls were good friends with Gina and were so familiar with this shortcut that they could take it late at night even despite the poor visibility, is it possible that this shortcut might have actually been their normal path for when they were over on this side of town? It's strange to think that the parents of the girls would have felt comfortable with them walking around the city so late at night, especially considering that there had already been 249 murder cases in Houston, Texas since the beginning of that year, which works out to on average one or two per day. In the next part we'll be taking a look at the parents response to finding out that their daughters were missing, the timeline in which the police were brought in, and the reason why I believe there's still a lot more to this case than was previously reported. I look forward to sharing that information with you in part three. I will see you at the next one. Hello and welcome to the bonus content of Innocence Lost, Part 3. In today's video, I'm going to present to you a very interesting discovery regarding the Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena case. And this new discovery that I found actually provides a very simple and logical reason for why the girls took the shortcut through T.C. Jester Park. Now before we get into all of that, I need to first circle back in how this discovery was made. You see, a few weeks ago, I stumbled across a very interesting picture on Pinterest. This picture was posted by a woman named Maria, and it's a picture of Elizabeth's parents, Adolfo and Melissa Pena. The parents are wearing white t-shirts with a photograph of both girls. Now, the reason that this particular photograph is important is because it appears to have been chronologically taken 
after the girls' high school yearbook photos. And I actually believe there's a chance that this picture was taken on the night of the pool party, or at least very close to it. And here's why I think that this might be the case. If you look at this picture, you'll notice that Elizabeth Pena has bangs. Now if you go onto Pinterest and you look up the Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena case, you can see younger pictures of both girls, and you'll notice that in these earlier pictures, Elizabeth never has bangs. But in this one particular photograph, she does. And that stands out to me. Another thing that stands out is that the shirt that Jennifer is wearing in this picture is not dissimilar to the one that she had laid across her head during the autopsy photos. I can't say for certain that this is the same shirt as the one that she wore to the pool party that night, but I do believe that there's a chance that this picture was taken on June 24th, if not on that night. Another thing that really stands out to me about this picture is that I noticed that Jennifer Ertman is not smiling. Jennifer and Elizabeth tend to be a little bit different in this regard. When it comes to taking photos, Elizabeth will usually smile in pretty much every picture that she's in, whether she's there by herself or with family or friends. Jennifer Ertman is usually a little bit more subdued. She'll sometimes give a half smile in pictures where she's just there by herself. But if we go back and look at the earlier pictures of Jennifer and Elizabeth together, Jennifer is always smiling. She always smiles when she takes pictures with her friends, but not on this particular night, possibly the night of the pool party, and perhaps even the last photo that was taken of the girls. And in my opinion, this is a red flag because at least on the surface of things, Jennifer Ertman should be having a great time right now. She's spending time with her friend Elizabeth. The two of them are going to go hang out with Gina Escamilla later on in the evening. You would think that this would be a pretty exciting night for Jennifer, but she doesn't look particularly happy in this photograph. And it almost feels like something might be on her mind. It makes me wonder if it has something to do with the fact that she's going to have to walk back home by herself later that night. You see, there's something that I haven't mentioned up to this point in my video series. And that something is that Jennifer Ertman was having to let herself into the family home with a spare key that her parents had made up for her. What I'm going to share with you next is actually going to be quite shocking. But this series is about uncovering the truth and I want this to be known because we need to know what these girls were really up against. This information comes directly from the book, Pure Murder, written by the late Corey Mitchell, who had the chance to sit down and interview both the Peñas and the Ertmans in the years after the crime. This book was written based off the information that he collected from both families, along with Corey Mitchell's own findings. I'm going to take a minute now to read three separate articles from Pure Murder. When she turned 13, she asked her parents for her own set of house keys. It was not for sneaky, ulterior motives. The Ertmans had two doors in the back of their home. One was the regular door, and the other was a door made of metal burglar bars, which was necessary because they lived on a nice street in one of the lower quality areas of the Heights. Jennifer wisely said, Mom, can I have my own keys so I don't have to keep bothering you? Sandra believed her daughter had proven she was responsible enough, so she had an extra set of keys made for her. Randy dropped Jennifer off at Elizabeth's house on Lamont Lane, approximately four and a half miles away from their home. Jennifer did not lean over to give her father a goodbye kiss. She had recently gotten out of the habit, due to embarrassment, being a teenager and all. Be home by midnight, her father reminded her. 
Sandra felt safe about letting her daughter go out for the night with friends. Jennifer had her pager and also cash in her purse. Her mother always left $35 on Jennifer's dresser every Thursday for allowance. Jennifer also received the same amount on Sundays and always kept a $10 bill in her pants pocket in case of emergency or if she needed to call a taxi cab. Sandra made sure her daughter knew that if she ever needed a ride home, all she had to do was get to a payphone and call her parents. They would come to get her no matter the situation. So yes, it's quite shocking as to what was written here in this book. Reading between the lines, it appears as though Randy and Sandra Ertman were expecting Jennifer to either walk home that night, get a ride back from one of her friends, or take a taxi cab back to their house. I'm going to show you the path that Elizabeth Pena and Jennifer Ertman would have taken. Now this map is not exactly perfect, but it's a pretty close representation of the way that they would have likely gone back home. According to the Google Map estimates, it would have taken about 35 minutes for the girls to reach Elizabeth's home on foot. Keep in mind that they would have been traveling at night, so the amount of time that this trip would have actually taken might have been significantly longer. As we deduced in part two, the girls were not in the park to make Elizabeth's 11.30 p.m. curfew because they encountered the gang at roughly the same time. Therefore, they would not have had enough time to make this curfew regardless of which way they chose to go back. They were also traveling with two other friends, so it would have been safer and probably easier for them to just keep heading down West 34th Street and then they could have gone up to T.C. Jester Boulevard once they hit the intersection. Alternatively, they could have also taken West 34th Street down to a road called Roslyn, which would take them very close to Elizabeth's house on Lamont Lane. This route would have actually been faster for the girls than had they gone up T.C. Jester Boulevard. And probably it would have even been faster than the route that they tried to take through the park. Again, this leads credence to the theory that the girls were not concerned about trying to make their curfew or that the curfew even existed for them in the first place. But there is one very relevant point that we must keep in mind, which is that Jennifer Ertman had not told her parents that she was planning to spend the night at Elizabeth's house. This implies that she was planning to walk back home and would have arrived at her house well after her midnight curfew, something that her parents claimed that she had never done before. According to Google Maps, this journey would have taken her at least two hours to complete on foot, giving the route that they did take through the park an additional level of plausibility. So why do I think that the girls decided to take the shortcut through T.C. Chester Park? Well, in my opinion, it's for the simple fact that it would have saved Jennifer Ertman a considerable amount of time in the nearly five mile walk that she had in front of her. If you put yourself in her position, you're out late at night in a very sketchy area of a big city. You're probably not gonna wanna be out on the streets walking around any more than you have to and since there isn't really anywhere that's safe for them to be, at least according to this map from crimegrade.org, it would make sense for Jennifer to want to get back home as quickly as possible. She has a very long walk in front of her, and so it would be very much to Jennifer's advantage to do what she can to save time here and there. The other person who could have played a role in their decision to go through the park was their friend, Gina Escamilla, who lived near the Clearbrook apartment complex and would have been familiar with the shortcut. She could have potentially suggested this to Jennifer Ertman if she had been looking for a more expedient way to get back home. One other thing that must be considered in all of this is that Sandra Ertman had actually spoken to her daughter over the phone 
when the girls were over at the Silver Creek apartment complex. Why is it that Jennifer's parents did not arrange a time to come and pick her up? Leaving her instead to have to find her way back home by walking through the sketchy and dangerous streets of Houston, Texas. In the late evening hours of June 24th, 1993, Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena would take a shortcut through the back of the Clearbrook apartment complex that would ultimately lead them across a railroad trestle and then back out on a T.C. Jester Boulevard. The official reason for taking this shortcut was because the girls had overstated a pool party that they were attending and that by taking this shortcut through the park, they would be able to make Elizabeth's 11.30 p.m. curfew. Throughout the course of this series, we've debunked this story as being the actual reason for their going through the park. The truth is that they never had the time to make this curfew, and their real reason for going through the park perhaps had something to do with avoiding a certain corner mall plaza at the intersection of West 34th Street and T.C. Chester Boulevard. In the 29 years since this horrible crime occurred, one of the most commonly asked questions that has so far gone unanswered is why didn't their parents simply give them a ride back home from the pool party? In today's episode, I'm going to introduce some unsettling new information that when fully expanded upon in part three will create a much different and I believe accurate reason for why Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena chose to take this dark and secluded pathway through T.C. Chester Park. To really understand this dangerous predicament that Jennifer and Elizabeth found themselves in, we need to first understand why this particular block between Mangum Road and T.C. Jester Boulevard was not a safe area for them to be walking around at late at night. When it comes to crime, the northwestern corner of Harris County has a reputation for being a bit of a mixed bag. And while it's true that crime can occur anywhere and at any time, there are certain areas where the likelihood of violent crime is much higher than others. Many Houstonians consider T.C. Jester Boulevard to be a sort of divider between the safe and dangerous areas. Neighborhoods located to the east side of this road, such as the Houston Heights neighborhoods, would generally be considered to be safe and in a desirable part of the city. But the apartment complexes located off of West 34th Street, such as the Spring Hill, Montebello, and Silver Creek Apartments, where Gina Escamilla lived, would not be considered to be in a safe area, especially at night. Unfortunately, Jennifer and Elizabeth couldn't have possibly known this as they were walking back to Elizabeth's house. But their decision to split off from their friends and instead walk back through T.C. Chester Park is an interesting one. This indicates to me that something else must have been driving their decision to get off of the main road. The shortcut that they took through the park wasn't necessarily the fastest way for them to get back home, nor was it the easiest. It could be argued that Roslyn Road, located just a block down the street from T.C. Jester Boulevard, would have been a far safer and easier route for the girls to have taken. Once again, this indicates to me 
that the reason for going through the park was to avoid having to walk past the strip club that was located in the corner mall plaza off of West 34th Street and T.C. Jester Boulevard. Essentially, it was just down the street from where the girls were coming from. However, taking this shortcut did have one unique benefit for Jennifer and Elizabeth, as it allowed them to avoid having to walk past the strip club. In fact, this is the only way that they could get back to Elizabeth's house without having to walk past it. West 34th Street, and specifically the area between Mangum Road and T.C. Jester Boulevard, is also known to have had problems with prostitution. Since there's a greater chance that they might have had an unwelcome encounter with a stranger who might have confused them as being workers in the adult industry, especially at this late hour of the night, I can see why Jennifer and Elizabeth might have wanted to take this shortcut through the park so as to avoid such an encounter. In fact, I believe this is the real reason for why Jennifer and Elizabeth decided to go through the park. I'm going to present to you a map of Houston, Texas, which shows the areas where prostitution arrests are at their highest. This map illustrates the top five areas where prostitution arrests were made back in 2015 and 16. Of these five areas, one of them is located very close to Independence Heights, not even five miles away from T.C. Jester Park. This map is a bit more telling when it comes to specific areas that experience higher levels of prostitution arrests. The area that I would like to bring your attention to is from Highway 290 over to Jester Boulevard, the area where Jennifer and Elizabeth were walking around at on the night of June 24th. We can see from this map that a high number of prostitution related arrests have been made in this general area, with some of the most frequent arrests occurring in the locations near the Spring Hill Apartments, Silver Creek Apartments, and Montebello Apartment Complex. Once again, it seems that we're coming back to the same question, which is, why didn't their parents simply offer to give them a ride back home? Hello and welcome to another bonus episode of Innocence Lost. In today's video, we're going to retrace the steps that Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena took through T.C. Jester Park. Having watched quite a few videos on this case, I've noticed that there are some discrepancies when it comes to understanding the route that the girls took through the park. In this video, I'll be attempting to clear up some of the misinformation about this case. Now before we get started, I would like to mention that for the purposes of this recording, I'll be using a video from a TikTok user named Lando23H1X. Under normal circumstances, I don't like to use other people's material, but since there isn't a lot of footage of this park to begin with, and I don't live just down the street from here either, I reluctantly decided to make an exception in this case. So thank you to Lando for making this recording available. I have included a link to his TikTok account in the description for this video. So we're going to start off in a location that's just to the west of where the girls encountered the gang. This part of the tracks that the cameraman is walking down is actually uh, a portion that Jennifer and Elizabeth never walked along themselves. I used to think that they were in this general area but the part that they came from is actually going to be up ahead a bit and it'll be off to a right. The time in which the girls were in the park is also an unknowable aspect. Some sources claim they were there as early as 1045. However, the court records indicate that it was most likely later than that 
sometime between 11.15 and 11.30 p.m. Now the time is a very important detail in this case because as we know they were taking the shortcut so as to make Elizabeth's curfew or at least that's the official um, explanation as to why they were going through the park. Now the spot that we're coming up to it's just before the bridge is the area where the crime occurred at. Jennifer and Elizabeth would have walked up this gravel slope and as they were making their way up to the top they would have encountered uh, the Sandoval brothers who were two of the gang members that were there uh, present at the gang initiation ceremony. The Sandoval brothers really didn't do anything at all. They just uh, continued to walk along shortly after they reached the top uh, is basically when they ran into the gang members. Um, I believe it would have been right around this spot most likely that they would have encountered the gang members. The route that the cameraman is taking right now is going in the general direction of T.C. Jester Boulevard. This is of course the way that the girls would have gone back home. That was what they were trying to do. And if you look uh, off in the distance, you can probably see a couple of cars going by every once in a while. That's the road they were trying to reach. Now I'm going to pause the video here for a minute. And you might be able to see off in the distance, there's a uh, area here where you can kind of see a couple of buildings. This is actually a storage unit. Um, and back 30 years ago when Jennifer and Elizabeth made this trip, um, it was actually a field. So there was a single light from what I was able to see from the pictures from back then and just a field that they would have walked through. And then there's a fence, which you can't really see very well from this um, video clip, but there's a fence there. They would have um, kind of gone in between the fence. The fence was connected with a, uh, with a chain. They would have been, been able to slip through the fence, and then they would have walked all the way up to uh, the train tracks and, of course, the trussle that the cameraman is on right now. The uh, water runway that you see underneath is the White Oak Bayou. Um, from what I understand, the water level was a bit higher, unfortunately, on this particular night also. So Jennifer and Elizabeth would not have had the option to cross over it and then go up uh, on the other side of the trussle to have avoided the gang. Another uh, unfortunate element to this particular story. So we're going to get our first real look here at the slope itself, and as we can tell, it's quite steep. Um, I would imagine it would be very difficult to walk up something like that late at night. Another interesting thing about this is that you'll notice when the cameraman reaches the ground level, you can really see on the other side um, quite easily. This is uh, something that I didn't know about when I first made um, Innocence Lost Part 2. I had assume you really couldn't see what was on the other side, but based off of um, this video, it appears that you can really see what would be on the other side. Of course, I really can't say, you know, what you would be able to see under those conditions. It was a moonless night, um, so I would think they probably would not have really been able to see the people on the other side of the bridge, but I, I don't know. It's impossible to say on that. So we're now going up the hill and we're going in the general direction of the memorial benches. And once again, this is an area that Jennifer and Elizabeth never walked through. This is uh, an area where I thought initially they were um, able to make it to. I kind of thought the gang was maybe somewhere up here, but they weren't. They were on the other side of the, of the bayou. And we've now reached the benches. This is the one for Jennifer Ertman. And the one over here is for Elizabeth Pena. So hopefully you guys found this video to be interesting. Um, I'm glad I was able to give a little bit more insight as to kind of what happened. I know this case can be kind of confusing because there's a lot of different stories about what actually happened on that night. But... Uh, Hopefully this kind of gives a better layout for the way that things unfortunately went down. Um, please leave me a comment in the comment section down below if you have anything you'd like to uh, 
say about this case and uh, thank you so much for watching. I will see you at the next one. Hello and welcome to today's video where I'm going to be reading from the 2008 best-selling novel, Pure Murder. This book was based off of a real-life event of 14-year-old Jennifer Lee Ertman and 16-year-old Elizabeth Christine Pena. Chapter 1 Jennifer Ertman Jennifer Ertman was born on August 15, 1978 to Sandra and Randy Ertman. The Ertmans were ecstatic at the birth of their child because they were not sure if they would ever be able to conceive since Sandra was on the wrong side of 35. Baby Jennifer was the Ertmans' own personal little miracle. Sandra described her only child as real sensitive, modest, funny. To her mother, Jennifer was more a child than teenager. She still seemed to act more like a young girl than a budding teenager. She liked to play. She had a baseball card collection. Her father also said that she developed a good sense of humor at an early age and that she had the best laugh. Her mother spoke about how Jennifer tended to act younger with the kids in her neighborhood than with her friends at school. She would ride her go-kart or bicycle down the street. She used to pull her wagons down the street with Ishmael, a boy down the block that she grew up with and his family. As Jennifer got older, she kept her more childlike side out of view of her high school friends. When she went to school, she didn't let her friends know that she did that at home. She tried to act more like a teenager. The Ertmans added that she was always a good kid. We were firm with her when she was growing up, Randy recalled. We taught her to never lie, cheat, or steal, and to treat everyone with respect. Randy added, as long as she never lied to me, I didn't have to worry. She never lied to me, so I never had to worry. Randy recalled yelling at her only three times in his entire life. He felt he never really had to raise his voice to her. We only had one child, and we spoiled her, but she had rules, and she had to live by them. Jennifer was always a very modest girl. She loved to swim, however she was not thrilled about displaying her body in front of others. Her mother remembered, in the summertime, when she went swimming, I bought her a big baggy cover-up to put on over her bathing suit when she got out of the swimming pool. Jennifer loved to swim, but she did not like to prance around in front of other pool goers. Her mother said she would even wear the cover-ups in the swimming pool. Jennifer also wore long baggy denim shorts that came down to her knees. Whenever she lay out by the swimming pool, she stayed away from the short shorts. She also never wore a sleeveless shirt. She dressed for comfort, her mother declared, and she dressed baggy because she didn't like anything tight. Jennifer was also not too big on boyfriends. She had friends that were boys, her mother clarified, but she did not have any boyfriends. Jennifer still seemed to retain some of her younger child mentality when it came to boys and girls. She didn't like boys to touch her at all. Jennifer was proud to be a virgin. Indeed, it was her intention not to surrender her virtue until she met the right man and married him. Her virginity was her badge of honor and something she was determined to keep until the moment was perfect. Sandra had noticed certain changes in her daughter in the previous months. To her, it seemed as if Jennifer was slowly breaking out of her little girl phase and beginning to grow into being a teenager. 
Jennifer used to wear berets in her hair all the time. However, she began to take them out so she could mimic the hairstyles worn by the actresses on the popular nighttime soap opera Beverly Hills 90210. It's what all the girls at Waltrip High School were doing, and she decided it was time to fit in. Jennifer also began to wear more jewelry. She had her ears double pierced, and on top of one ear, she had tiny diamond studs. She wore tiny dime-sized hoop earrings on the bottom. She also wore two long gold rope chains, one with the letter J on the end. The young girl wore a total of eight rings on her fingers, including two J-rings and one E-ring. Jennifer also began to put on makeup, even though her parents assured her she was beautiful without it. Despite her newer leanings towards more mature decorations, Jennifer also wore a Walt Disney Goofy watch, which was a gift from her parents from the previous Christmas. She was not entirely ready to give up her childhood. There was also another overt sign that the Ertman's baby daughter was growing up. When she turned 13, she asked her parents for her own set of house keys. It was not for sneaky, ulterior motives. The Ertmans had two doors in the back of their home. One was a regular door, and the other was a door made of metal burglar bars, which were necessary because they lived on a nice street in one of the lower quality areas of the Heights. Jennifer wisely said, Mom, can I have my own set of keys so I don't have to keep bothering you? Sandra believed her daughter had proven she was responsible enough, so she had an extra set of keys made for her. The Ertmans also purchased a unique gift for their daughter that showed that she was quickly growing up, a pager. Jennifer received the Southwestern Bell pager for Christmas in 1992. Sandra was reluctant to give it to her at first. During the 90s, pagers had a stereotypical connotation as a tool for drug dealers. Jennifer insisted she wanted one because it was a way to keep in touch with her friends. This was before the mass proliferation of cell phones. Sandra and Randy discussed the issue with Jennifer and the couple decided that because Jennifer was now attending Waltrip High School, she would not be in the Heights area where they lived as much. The family agreed it would be a smart purchase, so they bought her one. Sandra actually felt better about it because now she knew she could get in touch with her daughter much quicker in the event of an emergency. Thursday, June 24, 1993, 4 p.m., Erdman Residence, East 25th Street, Houston, Texas. Sandra walked into her daughter's bedroom Jennifer was getting ready to visit her best friend, Elizabeth Pena. Sandra glanced at her daughter, who was standing next to a mirror, brushing her hair. She was amazed at how much her daughter had grown, and she was proud of what a wonderful person she was turning out to be. Jennifer made straight A's in school, had nice friends, never got into trouble, and loved her parents. Dad's taking you over to Elizabeth's, Sandra informed her daughter. It was usually her mother who drove Jennifer everywhere. I'm going over to Apple Tree to pick up some groceries. Okay, Mom. Jennifer acknowledged while continuing to brush her hair. I love you, honey. Sandra walked towards her daughter. I'll talk to you later. The mother leaned over and gave her daughter a peck on the cheek. I love you too, Mom. Jennifer smiled as her mom exited her bedroom. Sandra felt safe about letting her daughter go out for the night with friends. Jennifer had her pager and also cash in her purse. Her mother always left $35 on Jennifer's dresser every Thursday for allowance. Jennifer also received the same amount on Sundays and always kept a $10 bill in her pants pocket in case of an emergency or if she needed to call a taxi cab. Sandra made sure her daughter knew that if she ever needed a ride home, all she had to do was get to a payphone and call her parents. They would come to get her, no matter the situation. Sandra left her home feeling upbeat. She knew her daughter was a good girl and knew how to stay out of trouble. Randy marveled at how close the two ladies in his life were. He watched as Sandy and Jenny communicated more I love yous 
without verbalizing them. They shared a unique and special bond that only a mother and daughter could experience. Jennifer and her dad left 15 minutes later. Randy dropped Jennifer off at Elizabeth Pena's house on Lamont Lane, approximately four and a half miles away from their home. Jennifer did not lean over to give her father a kiss goodbye. She had recently gotten out of the habit due to embarrassment, being a teenager and all. Be home by midnight, her father reminded her. I will, Dad. I love you. Jennifer said goodbye. I love you too, honey. Randy responded as he drove off. The self-described overprotective father did not like to leave his daughter on her own. However, he knew she was growing up. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Innocence Lost. In this video, I'm going to be reading from Corey Mitchell's best-selling novel, Pure Murder, a book that was based off of the real-life tragedy involving 14-year-old Jennifer Lee Ertman and 16-year-old Elizabeth Christine Pena. Chapter 2 Elizabeth Pena Elizabeth Christine Pena was born on June 21st 1977 at Memorial Hermann Northwest Hospital in Houston, Texas to her parents Melissa and Adolfo Adolf Pena. Melissa was 18 years old at the time and Adolf was 21. Melissa's water broke the night before and Adolf rushed her to the hospital at 2 a.m. After several hours of waiting, the nurses informed Adolf he could go back home and get some sleep. Sure enough, Less than two hours later, he received a call that his first child had been born with no complications. That was one of the most precious times in my life, Adolf recalled. That firstborn child, there's nothing like the first one. He described his immediate attachment to his daughter as pretty special. Adolf and Melissa used a baby name book to select Elizabeth. They were an ecstatic young couple looking forward to sharing their lives and love with her baby daughter. The Peñas had met just over two years before. Adolf, whose parents and grandparents grew up in San Antonio, Texas, moved to Houston with his parents in 1975 after his dad received a better job offer. He was the only child left in the house and the three of them packed up and moved southeast to Houston. Soon thereafter, Adolf went to a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young concert at Jefferson Stadium, the former home of the Houston Oilers football team and also the University of Houston Cougar College football team. There he met an attractive young white woman named Melissa Moore. The two hit it off as friends and promised to get together after the concert. One thing led to another and they found themselves in love, married, and with a child. The Peñas lived a quiet, relaxed life in their quaint home on Lamont Lane in northwest Houston. Their home was located in a pine tree lined suburban street less than a quarter of a mile away from Stevens Elementary and less than a half a mile away 
from TC Chester Park, with its clean bicycle paths and shade trees for people who sought exercise. Adolf described Elizabeth as a normal little kid who loved to play out in the backyard and swim in her little plastic swimming pool. Elizabeth was two years old when she was joined by her brother Michael. As brother and sister grew older, they fought constantly about the silliest things. Michael picked on Elizabeth and she told on him. They always seemed to be at each other's throats. Even though they loved one another tremendously, they shared a bedroom for 10 years and slept in bunk beds together. Adolf laughed when he talked about how Elizabeth and Michael used to fight. It was always over some piddly stuff. Oh mom, she's looking at me. Or, oh he's touching me. Just piddly kid stuff, like brothers and sisters do. When the oldest two children became teenagers, they kind of went their separate ways, according to Adolf. He got into basketball and baseball. She couldn't stand phys ed. She was into her things, so finally they quit fighting with each other. According to Adolf, Elizabeth was still very much a girly girl. She loved to dress up and look good. It was apparent early on that she was a beautiful little girl. All the Pena's friends and family members would comment on what a lovely young lady Elizabeth was from an early age. Elizabeth had very curly hair and loved to have it fixed up, but she hated having her hair washed. Her father and mother used to wash it in the sink and Elizabeth would scream at the top of her lungs while she was doused in water. No one knew why, but it became a source of humor for the entire family. When Elizabeth was almost 10 years old, the Pena's welcomed their third child into the fold, a baby girl named Rachel. Elizabeth immediately took to Rachel and constantly doted on her little sister. She adored Rachel and did everything she could to help her mother take care of her. She just thought she was the neatest thing Adolf recalled of his oldest daughter's fascination with the newest addition to the family. She thought the world of Rachel. By the time Rachel turned four, Elizabeth had already taken her under her wing and loved playing with her. Elizabeth was a decent student in school. Her father believed she was intelligent, but lazy. She did what she needed to do to get by, as far as books were concerned. She would do what she needed to pass, one of those types of people. Elizabeth was not interested in excessive studying or making the honor roll, according to Adolf. She was only a C to C minus student. She was more interested in enjoying herself, looking pretty, and making lots of friends. The older she got, the more everyone noticed her. She grew into a stunning, thin, young girl with long, dark hair. She was one of the most popular girls in each of her schools, from Oak Forest Elementary to Stevens Elementary. Her parents would not let Elizabeth attend F.M. Black Middle School, even though it was located just three blocks down in Lamont Lane. Her parents believed that there were too many bad things going on at Black, so they sent her to a private Catholic school. Her father even warned her about men of all ages. He told her that most men were only interested in one thing, and that she should always be aware of their intentions. He told her that since she was beautiful, men would try to take advantage of her, and she should not trust anyone, and always to be aware of her surroundings. Adolf did not mind if his little girl had a boyfriend. He just wanted to make sure that she was friends with the boy for a long time before they started dating. Just like me and Mama did. He worried about his little daughter having sex and getting pregnant. While Adolf fretted about his daughter's blossoming into a woman, Melissa Pena could still see the little girl quality within her oldest daughter. She described Elizabeth as fun-loving, goofy, silly, liked to talk on the phone, sweet, gentle, and kind. Elizabeth was young and carefree, with no plans. She thought she had a full life in front of her, Melissa recalled. According to Adolf, Elizabeth had always been a good kid until she turned 14. She started hanging around with the wrong crowd, a bunch of crazy little kids. She didn't care about nothing. She wasn't using any drugs or drinking any alcohol. 
She just kind of liked getting into trouble. Never went to jail, never in trouble with the law. Adolf did not think that the kids she hung out with were bad. They just seemed bored with life. There were no gang members, no drug dealers, no rapists, no killers. They were just bored and lifeless. This had been why the Pennies enrolled Elizabeth in St. Pius X Catholic Private School located in downtown Houston. This turned out to be a bad move as Elizabeth got into even more trouble. She was quickly removed from the private school after only six weeks. She had her first sexual relationship with a boy during this time frame. I don't know what it was Adolf recalled, but something about her from the age of 14 to 15 just went a little wild. She just seemed to want to get into trouble. Elizabeth took out most of her teenage rebelliousness on her parents. We would argue with her about coming home late or staying on the phone too long or for hanging out with the wrong type of people. Elizabeth would retaliate by running away from home twice. She'd sneak out the window and go to somebody's house, Adolf mused, and I wouldn't find out about it until the next day. Elizabeth usually ran away because she was upset with her parents over something trivial. She had gotten upset with us and went and stayed with one gal over at her house. She was harboring her for like two or three days. Adolf ran into the girl's father out in public and said to him, Dude, do you know you can go to jail for harboring a minor? All you had to do was tell me, Hey, your girl's over here. After Elizabeth was kicked out of St. Pius X, she was devastated and determined to start anew. She thought about the types of people she hung out with and came up with an insightful realization. She truly only had three or four friends she knew she could count on to help her out, no matter what. One of those friends was one of her newer girlfriends, Jennifer Ertman. Even though Jennifer was more than a year younger than Elizabeth, she would prove to be a positive influence on the older girl. Jennifer did well in school, obeyed her parents, and made plenty of friends as well. Elizabeth followed her new friend's lead and began to turn her life back around. I don't know what happened to her, Adolf recalled. She was a totally different person when she turned 15. She just straightened up her act. I don't know what somebody had said to her or what she had seen but she turned back into a little princess. She started doing well in school. She totally turned herself around, all by herself. It was kind of odd. The Pena's were happy that Elizabeth had befriended Jennifer. She was an extremely good kid, Adolf recalled. I can't imagine her being bad, with a dad like Randy. Jennifer was a little dull, Adolf continued. Every time she'd come into the house, she would make it a point to come over and say, Hello, Mr. Pena. Even if I was in another part of the house, she was a very, very polite young lady. Jennifer and Elizabeth had both attended Waltrip High School and had recently completed the ninth grade. The year at Waltrip, with Jennifer by her side, was the best year Elizabeth had spent in ages. Her grades were improving. She pared down her friends to those who truly cared for her, and she met a young boy with whom she fell into teenage love. It appeared as if things were back on the right track for Elizabeth Pena. For the last few years, Adolf and Melissa would take the family to Florida for a week to 10 day vacation. It was all about fishing and sunbathing. The boys went fishing, the girls went sunbathing. I was coming back from Florida and everybody was just happy. The kids were in the van, I looked up and saw my beautiful girl in the rearview mirror and thought to myself, what would happen if I didn't have these kids? It was a fleeting thought that Adolf had never had before. As quickly as it came into his mind, he shook it out. He looked up into the mirror and caught his daughter's attention. I love you, sweetie, Adolf told Elizabeth. She smiled. I love you too, daddy.
Hello and welcome to Innocence Lost, The Missing Pieces. This series was created in remembrance of 14-year-old Jennifer Lee Ertman and 16-year-old Elizabeth Christine Pena, who tragically lost their lives in the early morning hours of June 25th, 1993. Jennifer and Elizabeth were the victims of gang violence at its absolute worst and also a form of extreme criminal negligence, which I'll be getting into later in this series. Up until this point in Innocence Lost, we've covered the backstories of both Jennifer and Elizabeth, their plans for the evening of June 24th, the gang members in the park, Elizabeth's supposed 11.30 p.m. curfew, and their options for getting back home safely. In today's video, we're going to put it all together by taking out the pieces of this puzzle that don't fit and rearranging things so that we can finally understand why. Jennifer and Elizabeth were in T.C. Jester Park after the park had closed and also why they were the victims of this horrible, horrible crime. And now without further ado, welcome to Innocence Lost, The Missing Pieces.